Uh, today we're here with uh, Colonel Brown, the commanding officer of Army ROTC at Texas A&M. Uh, if you would, sir, could you just give us a brief uh, overview of your career so far in the Army? Uh, sure. I, I was commissioned at, uh, through ROTC out of Trinity University in San Antonio. I uh, was an armor officer, but I was actually an MI officer detailed to armor. Um, went to the uh, basic course Fort Knox, uh, went to Ranger School while I was there. My first assignment was in Germany. Uh, 467 Armor, which is a tank battalion in 1st Brigade in Friedberg. Um, while I was there, I was tank platoon leader, scout platoon leader, assistant S1, or uh, excuse me, assistant S3 and then an S1. And then when I left, I applied for and got a branch transfer to, uh, to remain Armor. So I stayed in Armor, went to the uh, career course at Fort Knox. Then I was in 3rd Cavalry Regiment at Fort Carson, where I was assistant regimental S3 um, and a cavalry troop commander in Lightning Troop 3rd Squadron. After that, I went to graduate school at the LBJ school. I got a degree in uh, public policy en route to teach at West Point. And I taught at West Point in the uh, Department of Social Sciences, American Politics for a couple of years. I uh, went to Fort Leavenworth to intermediate level education at the Command General Staff College. Then I um, got an assignment to 1st Cavalry Division. And I went to uh, 112 Cavalry. Um, they were in Iraq at the time, so I deployed straight from Fort Hood and took over while they were in theater and was in battalion S3 for about nine months in uh, East Baghdad. Came back, became the Brigade 3, then the Brigade XO, redeployed again with the same br Brigade, 1st Brigade. Uh, spent 13 months there uh, as the Brigade XO and then as the uh, G3 FU Ops for 1st Cavalry Division. Um, left there and went to Fort Carson again to uh, take command of uh, 361 Cavalry in uh, 4th Brigade, 4 ID. Uh, which is a light brigade, did um, about two and a half years in command there, including a year in Afghanistan, in Kunar province in Nuristan from 2009-2010. Uh, then I went to the Pentagon uh, and I was the um, country officer for Afghanistan in, in OSD policy for two years. Um, went to uh, the War College at uh, the Eisenhower School, uh, then did another assignment um, in force development and then was the uh, military assistant for the assistant secretary of defense for strategy plans and capabilities and then was lucky enough to get this assignment here I am. What do you expect from a new lieutenant and what's the most common thing for a new lieutenant to fail at? I mean the list of what you want expect from a lieutenant is pretty long. I mean you know you can go through the whole litany of yes be physically fit, be um, know your job, understand you know, the basics of tactics and the basics of what they've taught you during the schools. So, you, assuming you're going to come with all of that, there's two things that really I think the lieutenant's got to be focused on. Um, and one is you got to have a winning attitude. That winning is something that's contagious in the Army. And you have to strive to be the best at what you do. You have to be the best in your platoon at whatever task you're doing. You want to be the best amongst the lieutenants. You want to be the best amongst the officers. Um, and you want to build that same determination and drive within your organization and your soldiers. Um, and you find that that's contagious. So if your soldiers will see you want to be the best and they'll want to emulate you. And when everyone's got that same drive, then uh, you're going to find you're going to be successful. Now, the other side of that coin, though, is you've got to be a team player because you will see that some lieutenants will strive to be the best, but they'll do it at the cost of their peers. Um, and sometimes, you know, those within the same organization they are. It doesn't matter if you're the best platoon if the other platoons in your company aren't very good. Um, what you want is for you to be the best amongst a number of great platoons. So sharing your knowledge, um, helping out your buddies on your left and your right, uh, taking on the additional tasks that are required of you, um, and that means there's a certain degree of selflessness. So you have to have both of those things. Um, so that's really, you know, I think successful lieutenants that I've seen, that's what they do well, both those things. Now, the thing that second lieutenants fail at the most is they have difficulty holding their subordinates accountable to standards. Um, it's very difficult for them to be the bad guy. That they want to, uh, the things that make you successful amongst your peer group as you're growing up in life, um, you know, is you, you, you got to be reliable, you, you got to be friendly, you got to, I don't say nice necessarily, but 
um, you want to be a nice person. Um, and sometimes that's not what it takes to be a lieutenant. That you've got to be the bad guy. You have to enforce standards. Um, and that's a difficult thing to do. What training do we not receive as cadets do you think we should in order to be better second lieutenants? See, that really depends on the lieutenant. Because I'll tell you that the water's there. You just have to, you just have to drink it. Um, and whether or not you're getting the training you need entirely depends on what's your commitment to doing the things that are available to you. And are you taking your studies seriously? Are you volunteering to, to go that extra step and join the organizations that go a little bit further? Um, do you take your own self-study seriously? So all the training is there. I wouldn't say there's anything out there that you need to know as a second lieutenant you know, before you get to your career course that isn't available to you through the ROTC program. Now, whether you take the time and commitment to learn it, that's a different question. Uh, what qualities or characteristics or behaviors do you like to see as a, from a new lieutenant, maybe as a com company commander? Um, you know, first off, motivation. You, you, gotta want, you gotta love what you're doing. You have to be excited about where you are. Um, you, you know, and I've had that case where you, know, you come in and you have that first office call with lieutenant and you say, hey, why did you want to be an armor officer? He's responsible, well, sir, I didn't. I want to be an MP. Okay. Let's stop this conversation. You go outside, think about what you said, come back in and give me a different answer. Because even if you feel that way, um, you, as an officer, as a leader, you can't be a sad sack about what you're doing. Um, even if you decide, hey, maybe this, this isn't what I do with my whole life, you know, that's your job at this point. That's your responsibility. So you've got to live up to it. So motivation and, and a desire to do well and do the right thing is, is the key thing. Um, next is a sense of responsibility. And that is ownership of what you're responsible for. Knowing what your job is. Not waiting for someone to tell you what to do. Not waiting for someone to come in and show you um, where you're wrong or you're flawed or you're not doing things well. But to say, this is, this is my piece of ground and I'm going to do the best I can within this. So um, the lieutenants that really do well are self-directed uh, and they're self-motivated and they're, they're looking to achieve excellence without somebody holding their feet to the fire all the time. And then you know, the third thing I would say is really integrity. And it's, you know, you have, you have to tell the truth. You have to be able to tell people hard truths. You have to be trustworthy. Um, and that Again, it's something that's hard for, for all officers, you know, all soldiers, everyone to do, is when you know the truth is not going to be well received and you're going to get a butt chewing for it, is to go up and say, hey, boss, we're screwed up, here's how, and then here's what I'm going to do to fix it, and here's when it's going to be done by. And if you go in with that kind of attitude, usually, you know, it'll work out okay. You know, the worst thing is um, to tell a lie um, to cover something up and then have it come out later because it never gets better with age. What piece of life advice do you wish all second lieutenants should know? I mean, since you're talking about life advice, you know, I would say that um, you've got to be honest with yourself about your goals and your ambitions. Um, and that's not to say you're going to have it all figured out as a lieutenant. And as a young officer, you don't know exactly, hey, well, what do I want in the Army? I don't really know. Um, but you, it, to the extent that you can, be honest with yourself about that. And hey, you know, my goal, I want to do eight years and get out. Okay? Um, make it the best eight years that it can be. You know, prepare yourself and do the best you can while you're there. Um, if you say, hey, I want to do 20, I want, and I want to command a battalion, be a lieutenant colonel, that's fine. Um, if you say, hey, look, I want to be a general officer. Okay. Um, you're never going to tell anybody that. But be honest with yourself that that's really what I want um, because that's going to shape the choices that you have to make. And you may not know exactly what those are right then, but over the course of your career, you know, as over time, you'll kind of figure that out. So um, know what you want to do and then understand what it takes to get there and make a plan for it. Because if you just kind of, if you kind of get there and, well, I don't know really what I want, I don't know what jobs I want to have, I'm just going to meander through life. You know, the Army will certainly put you where they want you um, if you allow them to. You've got to control your own life and your own career 
in a way that makes you happy, satisfies you and your family, um, and know that there are sacrifices involved. The question is, what was the last leadership book you read? So this, this is an interesting question. You know, I think the last book I read was uh, Leaders Eat Last uh, by Simon Sinek. But you didn't ask me what I thought was the last good book that I read. Because <laughs> that one, I, I really didn't think that much of it, to say the truth. Um, there were dimensions of it that I did think were interesting. Um, the, the physiological aspects of, uh, of leadership, I thought were kind of interesting in that. Uh, but a lot of it had sort of a component of hero worship that was really unrelated to the point that he was trying to make. And, you know, as I thought about it and was talking this through with the other exes, I kind of realized I'm not a big fan of, of leadership books um, because I find most of them to be, you know, either pop psychology, you know, some component of he hero worship by biographers who, you know, place leaders up on a pedestal without sort of having a balanced view of them as people and you know, showing their clay feet, um, or else they're sort of self-rationalizing uh, by people who you know, may have been successful and they're, they're explaining themselves um, and their behavior, their actions in a way that puts themselves in, in the best light. So it's hard when you're writing about contemporary topics to really have a good view. And I think some of the best books on leadership are probably fiction. Uh, because they can be divorced from that hero worship and self-rationalization. Um, and as I was thinking through, I think honestly some of the best books I've ever read on leadership are um, by C.S. Forster, um, the Horatio Hornblower series. Uh, and yeah, I, I got it, it's naval, uh, it's not army, but it's leadership in, in warfare, it's um, dealing with complicated situations, it's dealing with toxic leaders, it's dealing with um, getting the best out of your subordinates. It's you know, struggling with your own limitations, you know, your senses of ina inadequacy, um, and it's facing mortal danger uh, when everyone's losing their head around you and you have to be the one who's thinking. And I think you know, looking at that, it's not, it's not history per se, but it's certainly accurate. You know, it's, it's, it's written in a way that I think you can draw a lot of, out of it um, because the best teacher of leadership, I think, is experience. It's not reading it, you know, doctrine in a book. It's, you know, the course of your time and the course of your career looking at people and how they act and seeing who's successful and seeing who's not. Identify the positives that you see and say, I want to be like that. And then look at other people and say, you know, there's some negative dimensions there. I don't want to be like that. And you pick and choose those things. Some you're going to get out of books. Most you're going to get out of personal experience. And you build that sort of theory and philosophy over time that best fits your personality. Um, and the good leaders, I think, do that. Uh, they emulate in some ways. They, is, is dissimulate a word? <laughs> they, they look at other, others as a bad example and say, I'm not going to be that way. And then you know, they build their own leadership model. And then later on, they'll try to explain that, maybe if they're successful enough in a book, and say, well, this is how I got to be this way. Um, but you have to, you kind of figure it out for yourself at the same time. All right, that's all the questions we have today. Thank you so much, right. sir. Thanks.